In his autobiography, 19th century preacher Charles Haddon Spurgeon records a conversation he had with his wife one Sunday evening. I fear I have not been as faithful in my preaching today as I should have been. I've not been as much in earnest after poor souls as God would have me be. Go, dear, to the study and fetch down Baxter's Reform Pastor and read some of it to me. Perhaps that will quicken my sluggish heart. Spurgeon was not the only one helped by this 17th century British Puritan's writings. Baxter has been called the greatest of all English preachers, the most energetic and successful pastor since New Testament times, the virtual creator of popular Christian literature, and the most successful preacher and winner of souls and nurturer of one souls that England has ever had. Dr. D. Martin Lloyd-Jones testified that his own interest in the Puritans began in 1925 when he read a biography of Richard Baxter. Salisbury argues that just as Spurgeon is known as the Prince of Preachers, that Baxter must be considered the Prince of Pastors. So who was this man, Richard Baxter, and what does he have to say to us today? Dr. William Bates, who preached Baxter's funeral message, recognized the difficulty of summarizing the life of this man. He said, I am sensible that in speaking of him, I shall be under a double disadvantage. For those who perfectly knew him will be apt to think my account of him to be short and defective, an imperfect shadow of his resplendent virtues. Others, who were unacquainted with his extraordinary worth, will from ignorance or envy be inclined to think his just praises to be undue and excessive. And as one biographer warns of trying to compress Baxter's life into a few pages, saying men of his size should not be drawn in miniature. But in the next hour, I'm going to try and draw this man's life. Richard Baxter was born November 12, 1615 at Roughton, a village in Shropshire, England. It was his destiny to live and minister throughout most of the 17th century, truly a watershed in English history. Before his death in 1691, he would witness the English Civil War, the beheading of Charles I, the Commonwealth under Oliver Cromwell, the restoration of the monarchy under Charles II, the persecution of nonconformity, the great ejection of some 2,000 Puritan pastors from their churches, and the struggle for toleration, which culminated in the act of toleration of 1689. Baxter was no passive observer of these events, no idle bystander. As a prominent religious leader, he actively participated in the numerous political and ecclesiastical struggles of his day. When viewed in light of his later influence, Baxter's early years were far from promising. No one could have guessed that this boy, born to Richard and Beatrice Baxter, would amount to much of anything. He was forced to live until the age of 10 with his maternal grandfather because of his father's gambling debts. His early schooling proved a great disappointment. In six years, he had four different schoolmasters, all of them ignorant or drunkards. After his father's conversion, Young Richard returned to his parental home at Eton Constantine. Unfortunately, however, his return brought no improvement to his educational environment. The vicar there, who was over 80 and who never had preached in his life, brought forth a motley assortment of substitutes to fill in for him, among them a day laborer, a stage player, and a common drunkard. The condition of the area clergy and churches was so low that little or nothing could be expected from them in the way of spiritual nurture. The crude and meaningless manner of his confirmation at age 14 only made matters worse. The bishop did not examine any of the boys who were present as to their spiritual condition. Instead, he quickly lined them up and passed down the line, laying his hands on them and uttering a few words of a prayer that neither Baxter nor the other boys could decipher. And as Baxter would later lament, he was esteemed as one of the best bishops in England. Baxter's comments demonstrate that the Puritans had legitimate complaints about the spiritual state of the Church of England. 
Despite the lack of piety in the established church, young Richard was not left without spiritual guidance. Through his father's example and by the reading of some Christian books, Baxter recounts that at about age 15, it pleased God to awaken my soul. The role that books played in his own conversion was not lost on Baxter, and he would write numerous treatises on conversion to help others find the way of salvation through Christian literature. He passionately desired university training, but had to settle for private tutoring. He studied at Ludlow Castle under Richard Wickstead. Wickstead, however, all but neglected Baxter, forcing him to begin what proved to be a lifetime of learning through independent study. Baxter's greatest regret was his neglect of languages in his education. Besides the Latin tongue, he said, and but a mediocrity in Greek with an inconsiderable trial at the Hebrew long after, Baxter said, I had no great skill in languages. James Stephen argues that Baxter was guilty of gross understatement at this point. Stephen says Baxter was ignorant of Hebrew, a mere smatterer in Greek, and possessed of as much Latin as enabled him to use it with reckless facility. Though not formally tutored, Baxter made good use of the excellent library at Ludlow Castle. He was a vociferous reader, with one biographer arguing that Baxter probably read more books than any other human being before him. Now, while that claim would be impossible to verify, one is overwhelmed by Baxter's incessant citation of other sources in his own writing, oftentimes from memory. Baxter's lack of formal training refined his logical mindset, his independent thinking, and his eclecticism. He was beholden to no particular school of thought. He felt free to borrow from them all or to critique them all. When criticized for taking a position against the common consensus on a particular issue, Baxter replied that he valued theologians by weight, not by number. A growing desire to be used in the conversion of others led him to seek ordination within the Church of England. And immediately after his ordination, Baxter served for nine months as a schoolmaster in Dudley while preaching in vacant pulpits on Sunday. In the autumn of 1639, Baxter left Dudley for the position of curate, which would be an assistant pastor in Bridge North, where he remained for nearly two years. While Baxter was at Bridge North, the parishioners of Kidderminster threatened to petition Parliament against their vicar on charges of incompetence and drunkenness. Baxter recorded that the vicar's preaching was so terrible that his own wife would leave the services in shame. Those of us who preach, hopefully, have never had that happen to us. To avoid the scandalous consequence of exposure from such a petition, the vicar of Kidderminster agreed that he would give up his pulpit to any lecturer whom the parishioners might select. The parishioners formed a selection committee of 14 members, and in March 1641, they invited Baxter to be their lecturer. Baxter accepted the position of lecturer at Kidderminster in 1641. Here in a township of some 4,000, after uh, first for 15 months and then after a five-year interruption because of the English Civil War for 14 years, Baxter exercised pastoral ministry. And it's ironic that the very thing for which Baxter is today renowned, his pastoral ministry, was not foremost on his heart when he accepted this position. In fact, he notes that the greatest attraction to him in going to Kidderminster was that he would have no pastoral responsibilities outside of giving the weekly sermon. When the Civil War broke out in 1642, Baxter was forced to withdraw from his parish. Though loyal to monarchy, it already intimated his sympathy with the parliamentary party, regarding it as the champion of religion and liberty. Baxter's sympathies with Parliament inflamed the royalists of the town against him. The entire county had openly declared its support for the king, and Kidderminster was entirely under the influence of royalist families living there. So despite his attempt to remain aloof from the struggle, after one of the townspeople publicly denounced him as a traitor, 
Baxter fled the city. When he left, he expected to return within a few weeks. He thought the war would be very short-lived. Actually, he was away for nearly five years. He first went to Coventry, where he preached once a week to the soldiers. Three years later, he accepted a chaplaincy in Cromwell's army, a post he held for two years. He was forced to resign his chaplaincy because of poor health. And for five months, Baxter languished near death at the home of some friends, Sir Thomas and Lady Jane Rouse. During these months in 1647, he took up his pen and wrote most of the saints' everlasting rest. Baxter notes in the dedication that he wrote the book with one foot in the grave. His account of the origin and progress of the work is interesting. He said, the second book which I wrote was that called The Saints' Everlasting Rest. When I was in health, I had not the least thought of writing books or of serving God in any more public way than preaching. But when I was weakened with great bleeding and was sentenced to death by the physicians, I began to contemplate more seriously on the everlasting rest which I apprehended myself to be just on the borders of and that my thoughts might not too much scatter in my meditation, I began to write something on the subject. The Saint's Everlasting Rest, eventually published in 1649, was a runaway bestseller. It went through 10 editions in 10 years, selling thousands of copies. Baxter maintains, weakness and pain helped me to study how to die. That set me on studying how to live. Baxter believed that his sickness provided numerous benefits, including greatly weakening temptations, keeping him in great contempt of the world, and teaching him to highly esteem time. Most significantly, Baxter claims that his illness made me study and preach things necessary and a little stirred up my sluggish heart to speak to sinners with some compassion as a dying man to dying men. This phrase became his motto, a guidepost for his life and ministry. He uses the phrase over and over again in his works. His life was a constant struggle with death. He was harassed by a constant cough, frequent bleedings from the nose, migraine headaches, digestive ailments, kidney stones, gallstones, etc., 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 He's been called a virtual museum of diseases. And living in an era before painkillers, Baxter tells us that from the age of 21 onwards that he was seldom an hour free from pain. Ears notes that Baxter was at death's door 20 times. John Brown asserts, if Richard Baxter had done nothing but take care of himself as an invalid, no one would have had the heart to blame a man whose life was thus one long and weary battle with disease. After recovering from his illness, he returned to his ministerial duties at Kidderminster in June of 1647, where his life became a model of ministerial consistency and faithfulness. In addition to his regular parish work between 1647 and 1660, he still found time to write and publish 57 books including the Reformed Pastor, a treatise on conversion, and call to the unconverted. He also served as the catalyst in forming the Worcestershire Association of Ministers in the area around Kidderminster. They met together regularly for mutual edification and to cooperate in furthering the gospel in their county. When once asked to which church he belonged, Baxter replied, I am a Christian, a mere Christian, of no other religion, and the church that I am of is the Christian church, and hath been visible wherever the Christian religion and church hath been visible. But you must know what sect or party I am of. I am against all sects and dividing parties. As a mere Christian, I follow mere Christianity. C.S. Lewis acknowledges his indebtedness to Baxter for the title of his famous work, Mere Christianity. In the preface, Lewis explains the scope and intent of Mere Christianity. This book, he says, offers no help 
to anyone who is hesitating between two Christian denominations, since my goal is not to convert anyone to my own position. Lewis says he is concerned not with controversial matters in dispute between different communions, but with the exposition in defense of what Baxter calls mere Christianity. One of Baxter's favorite quotations was, Unity in things necessary, liberty in things unnecessary, and charity in all. The phrase, though not original with Baxter, was popularized by him, not only in England, but also on the continent. One of his favorite maxims was, Overdoing is the most ordinary way of undoing. But he could quote it better than he could live it. A great part of his life was was spent trying to quiet the controversies that he himself had started. While his heart desired peace, he was too blunt to be a bridge builder. Salisbury claims in very picturesque fashion, Baxter's overtures of peace more often than not had the effect of an olive branch discharged from a catapult. Baxter's success at Kidderminster is legendary. Initially, he recorded all the names of his converts, but they became so numerous, he was obliged to discontinue the practice. He writes, In the beginning of my ministry, I numbered them as jewels, but since then I could not keep any number of them. And I simply note that is an amazing admission by a pastor and evangelist. Unless we think his task was easy, note carefully John Brown's observations on pre-Baxter Kidderminster. John Brown writes, If I were asked what in the year 1646 was one of the most unpromising towns in England to which a young man could be sent who was starting his career as a preacher and pastor, I should feel inclined to point at once to the town of Kidderminster in Worcestershire. With a population at that time between three and 4,000, mainly carpet weavers, it had been morally and spiritually so grossly neglected as almost to have sunk into practical heathenism. But Baxter describes the transformation that God brought to the city. He writes, The congregation was usually full so that we were fain to build five galleries after my coming thither, five building programs. Our private meetings also were full. On the Lord's Day, there was no disorder to be seen in the streets. But you might hear a hundred families singing psalms and repeating sermons as you pass through the streets. In a word, when I came thither first, there was about one family in a street that worshipped God and called on His name. And when I came away, there were some streets where there was not past one family in a side of a street that did not do so, and that did not, by professing serious godliness, give us hopes of their sincerity. And the fruit remained. Illustrative of the quality of his ministry is the following statement, written some six years after he was forced to leave Kidderminster. Though I have now been absent from them for about six years, And they have been assaulted with pulpit calumnies and slanders and threatening and imprisonments with enticing words and seductive reasonings. Yet they stand fast and keep their integrity. Not one that I hear of are fallen off or forsake their uprightness. But Baxter's ministry was not limited to Kidderminster. After King Charles I was beheaded in 1649, Baxter preached before Cromwell, the Lord Protector of the newly formed Commonwealth. After the service, the Protector asked him to a meeting. Cromwell proceeded to enter into a lengthy exposition and justification of his policy and the changes in the government which he said God had made. Baxter's reply was blunt. I told him that we took our ancient monarchy to be a blessing and not an evil to the land. While he wrote freely upon Cromwell's faults, Baxter forthrightly acknowledged that under his rule, religion had prospered. He wrote, I bless God who gave me, even under an usurper whom I opposed, 
such liberty and advantage to preach his gospel with success, which I cannot have under a king to whom I have sworn and performed true subjection and obedience. Baxter believed no previous era in English history had afforded such opportunities for the spread of the gospel. After Oliver Cromwell's death in 1658 and the short rule by his son Richard, Parliament voted on May 1, 1660 to recall Charles II. Baxter was in London at the time, working for religious reconciliation and concord. On the day before this crucial decision, April 30th, Baxter preached before the members of the House of Commons in St. Margaret's, Westminster. His subject was repentance. His text, Ezekiel 36, verse 31. He also preached on May the 10th at St. Paul's Cathedral before the Lord Mayor. The day had been appointed by the House of Commons as a day of thanksgiving for General Monk's success and the prospective restoration of the monarchy. The point of Baxter's sermon was too obvious to be missed. Titled, Right Rejoicing, his text was Luke chapter 10, verse 20. Nonwithstanding in this, rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. After King Charles II's coronation, Baxter became one of his chaplains. He preached before the king and for a time exercised considerable influence at court. Charles would later offer him the bishopric of Hereford, which he declined rather than give up his nonconformist views. These days at court were to but prove the calm before the storm. Twenty years of brutal oppression would soon begin during which Baxter would be harassed by spies, fined and imprisoned under the rule of this same king. The nonconformists were largely Puritans who could not in good conscience subscribe to all the tenets of the Church of England, some of which were remnants from Roman Catholicism, especially the prescribed use of certain elements in the prayer book. On May 19, 1662, the Act of Uniformity established these doctrines and practices as the official position of the Church of England, and officially uh, removed from their ecclesiastical assignments or places of ministry, all who disagreed and who refused to conform. Not waiting until the August 24th deadline when the act would be enforced, Baxter let it be known immediately that he would not conform. He left the Church of England on May the 25th. 2,000 of his fellow ministers would follow soon thereafter. The disappointment in his silencing, as he called it, was somewhat tempered by an unexpected but blessed event. On September 10, 1662, Baxter married Margaret Charlton. In the earlier period of his ministry, Baxter had resolved not to marry so that he could pursue his pastoral and ministerial duties without interruption. Because of his clear belief that most clergy should not marry due to the demands of ministry, Baxter notes that his marriage caused quite a stir. He said, and it everywhere rung about partly as a wonder and partly as a crime. And I think the king's marriage was scarce more talked of than mine. After his ejection, however, having no specific pastoral responsibilities, he thought himself sufficiently free to take a wife. And Margaret served as a beautiful helpmeet to Richard. Seth Osborne is going to unpack more on their marriage. She was in every sense a woman of God in her own right. Friends noted they had never known anyone with a more fervent prayer life. She kept a skull on her nightstand to remind herself of the brevity of life. And one side note about their relationship, if Baxter had gotten his way, he would have spent virtually all of his time in his writing ministry. But Margaret forced Richard to put down his pen and come to the table for his meals. And there to talk about, and I quote, mundane matters bearing no relation to theology. During the three years of his residence in London, two before and one after his silencing, Baxter preached in various places as opportunities presented themselves. 
In July of 1663, he moved from London to the country village of Acton that he might devote himself more fully to study and writing. He was one of the most voluminous writers in English history, writing between 141 and 200 books, depending on how one divides his writing. Baxter wrote treatises on grace and salvation, apologetics, popery, antinomianism, the sacraments, millenarianism, ethics, nonconformity, devotion, conversion, politics, and history, not to mention a systematic theology in Latin. Someone has observed, to ask Baxter for a reason for the faith within him was to invite an answer in three volumes. Yet he had not only quantity, but also quality. N.H. Keeble says the influence of his books is incalculable. From the early 1650s, they enjoyed greater sales than those of any other English writer. As he continued his writing ministry, people continued to desire his preaching and teaching. Despite the recently enacted Conventical Act, Bacter held meetings in his home. The Conventical Act of 1664 forbade the assembly of more than five persons who were above 16 years of age for the purposes of worship other than by the forms of the Church of England. Baxter felt he could continue to hold meetings in his home because the activities there, preaching, praying, and singing psalms, were in agreement with the forms of the Church of England. During his residence at Acton, the Great Plague of London burst forth with tremendous fury. Beginning in December of 1664, this pestilence raged for over a year. Yet Baxter recognized God's providence, even in this horrible event. Many of the ejected ministers seized the opportunity of preaching in the neglected or deserted pulpits with good results. Baxter said, when the plague grew hot, most of the conformable ministers fled. They left their flocks in their time of their extremity. Where nonconformists, pitying the dying and distressed people, came to them to comfort them in their terrors. They resolved that no obedience to the laws of mortal man whatsoever could justify them for neglecting of men's souls and bodies in such extremities. Therefore, they resolved to stay with the people and to go into the forsaken pulpits, though prohibited by law, and to preach to the people before they died, and also to visit the sick and to get what relief they could for the poor. The conditions there were ripe for a significant response. Baxter says the face of death did so awaken both the preachers and the hearers that the preachers exceeded themselves in lively, fervent preaching and the people crowded constantly to hear them. And all was done with so great seriousness as that through the blessing of God... Abundance were converted from their carelessness and youthful lusts and vanity. And religion took that hold on the people's hearts as could never afterwards be loosed. You get the sense that during that time, these preachers were preaching as dying men to dying men. To make matters worse, scarcely had the plague ceased when the great London fire began. Seeing earthly goods go up in flames only increased Baxter's awareness of the vanity of this world. Initially, no action was taken against Baxter for his preaching at Acton. But his services became so popular with people crowding in and out of his house to hear that could no longer be ignored. The authorities issued a warrant for his arrest in June of 1669 on charges of holding worship services contrary to law. Baxter was imprisoned for six months in the new prison at Clerkenwell. His imprisonment, Baxter says, was no great suffering to me. He had a good jailer, a large room, and Margaret had the freedom of visitation. He notes that except for the interruption of his sleep, that the accommodations at the, ja at the jail were better than the lodgings he typically stayed in during his frequent visits to London. When someone suggested that his views might change somewhat because of his imprisonment, Baxter replied, truth did not change because I was in a jail. 
after he was released from prison, he settled back into his writing ministry, but continued to preach wherever divine providence opened a door for him. He spoke at various churches in the city facing constant harassment and confiscation of his property. On one occasion, the authorities even took Baxter's bed from underneath him, despite the fact that he lay there sick. But Baxter kept it all in perspective. He said, naked I came into the world, and naked must I go out. But I never wanted less what man can give than when man had taken all away. He would also note, I am more apprehensive that sufferings must be the church's most ordinary lot. And Christians must indeed be self-denying cross-bearers even when none but formal, nominal Christians be the cross-makers. He was a powerful preacher. And it was recorded on one occasion when he was preaching a sermon on judgment that the officials in the audience who had come to spy on him fled the service in terror. The coming of James II to the throne upon Charles, of James II to the throne upon Charles II's death in 1685 boded ill for the nonconformists, especially for Baxter. James was a pronounced Roman Catholic who saw his strongest opponents among the nonconformists. Baxter was again in prison, this time for 18 months, beginning in 1685. His prison sentence was based on the ludicrous charge that his paraphrase of the New Testament was an attack on the established church and state. The charge was sedition. The way that Baxter had paraphrased some of the verses was seen as an attack on Britain's rulers. Baxter later commented that by the same logic, he could have been indicted for merely uttering the words, deliver us from evil in the Lord's Prayer. The unjustness of his trial is legendary in English history. Judge Jeffries ridiculed Baxter and his supporters saying to Baxter, you are full of poison and deceit. I can see it in your face. Baxter replied, oh, I did not realize my face was a mirror. He appeared for sentencing on the 29th of June. Jeffries wished him to be publicly whipped, but the other judges would not consent that a man to whom a bishopric, bishopric had been offered should be punished as a felon. He was fined 500 marks and imprisoned until it was paid. Baxter refused to pay the fine imposed upon him because he knew that it would be repeated and enforced any time he attempted to preach or any time he wrote anything that could possibly be objected to by the court. He also refused on principle to petition for his release from this unjust imprisonment. He was finally freed on November 24, 1686. Upon his release, he continued his writing ministry as well as preaching whenever he could. William Bates observed the last time Baxter preached, he almost died in the pulpit. And Bates notes, it would have been his glory to have been transfigured on the mount. Even on his deathbed, Baxter did not abandon his calling. He was the same in life and death. His last hours were spent preparing others and himself to appear before God. To some who came to visit him, he remarked, You come hither to learn to die. I am not the only person that must go this way. I can assure you that your whole life, be it never so long, is little enough to prepare for death. Have a care of this vain, deceitful world and the lusts of the flesh. Be sure you choose God for your portion. Heaven for your home, God's glory for your end, His word for your rule. And then you need never fear, but that you shall meet with comfort. A few hours before his departure, Baxter was asked how he was. His reply, almost well. On December 8, 1691, this great preacher entered into that everlasting rest that he had so often and so confidently spoken and written about. What legacy did this great man of God leave to us? He was ahead of his time in terms of encouraging support for missions. 
He corresponded regularly with John Eliot and said, No part of my prayers are so deeply serious as that for the conversion of the infidel and ungodly world. His poetical works and hymns have also blessed believers. Two of them we still find in hymnals today, Ye holy angels bright, and Lord, it belongs not to my care. Ye holy angels bright was written following his wife Margaret's death in 1681. Listen to these words in light of that context. Ye holy angels bright, who wait at God's right hand, or through the realms of light, fly at your Lord's command. Assist our song, or else the theme too high doth seem for mortal tongue. Ye blessed souls at rest, speaking of his wife, who ran this earthly race, and now from sin released, behold your Savior's face. His praises sound as in his sight, with sweet delight ye do abound. Ye saints who toil below, adore your heavenly King, and onward as you go, some joyful anthem sing. Take what he gives and praise him still, though good or ill, whoever lives. My soul, bear thou thy part, triumph in God above. And with a well-tuned heart, sing thou the songs of love. Let all thy days, till life shall end, whate'er he sin, be filled with praise. And then the words of, Lord, it belongs not to my care. Lord, it belongs not to my care, whether I die or live. To love and serve thee is my share. And this thy grace must give. If life be long, I will be glad that I may long obey. If short, yet why should I be sad to welcome endless day? Christ leads me through no darker rooms than he went through before. He that unto God's kingdom comes must enter by this door. Come, Lord, when grace hath made me sweet, thy blessed face to see. For if thy work on earth be sweet, what will thy glory be? Then I shall end my sad complaints and weary sinful days, and join with the triumphant saints that sing my Savior's praise. My knowledge of that life is small, the eye of faith is dim, but tis enough that Christ knows all, and I shall be with him. Baxter's ongoing influence has largely been through his practical works, especially the Reformed pastor, Call to the Unconverted, and the Saints' Everlasting Rest. His Christian directory, first published in 1673 and subsequently published as Volume 1 in the four-volume Practical Works of Richard Baxter, runs to over one million words on almost 1,000 pages. Tim Keller has claimed the Christian Directory is the greatest manual on biblical counseling ever produced. Dr. Don Whitney, now my colleague here at Southern, told me that when he was in pastoral ministry, he bought two copies of the Christian Directory so it would always be within reach, whether he was in his office at home or at the church. The influence of the Reformed pastor was great in his own day and has continued to the present. Its contemporary influence is reflected in the extant correspondence of Baxter. Numerous letters from fellow ministers testified as to its influence in their lives. Also, Philip Jacob Spainer, Wesley, Rutherford, and Asbury all spoke in glowing terms of the book's impact on their lives. Philip Dotteridge said the book should be required reading for every pastor before he takes a church. And it should be reviewed every three or four years by that pastor. J.I. Packer maintains that every pastor should read the the Reformed pastor every single year of his ministry. Let me quote Dr. Packer. If you are in pastoral ministry and you do not have a well-worn copy of the Reformed pastor on your shelf, you're nuts. Direct quote. So what about us today? What can we learn from the life and ministry of this man? 
Well, in typical Puritan fashion, I would like to end with application or what the Puritans called uses. Let me begin this exhortation to the contemporary church with two disclaimers. First, Baxter was far from perfect, especially from a Baptist perspective. As a Southern Baptist, I would want to help Baxter with a few of his theological formulations. His emphasis on infant baptism, his views on episcopy, his lack of emphasis on equipping the saints for the work of ministry, and certainly his views on the benefits of a celibate clergy. Second, we need to remember that Baxter lived in a very different age than we do today. Kidderminster was part of a parish system where all the inhabitants of the city saw Baxter's church as their church. Kidderminster was also prominent as a carpet weaving town and most people worked in their homes. Those realities gave Baxter great freedom to pursue the home visits for which he is widely remembered. Now, despite the differences in theological perspectives on some issue and the distance of time and culture, I, I believe Baxter has a great deal to say to the contemporary church today. And I want to draw some conclusions and instruction mainly from the Reformed pastor. The Reformed pastor actually grew out of a sermon that Baxter was supposed to give to the Worcestershire Association. The, the day that he was to give that sermon, he was too ill to go. So they asked if, if he would publish the sermon, so he added a little, bit, a little bit of material, and it came out as what we know today as the Reformed pastor. It was based on an exposition and application of Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God which he has purchased with his own blood. By reform, Baxter means not Calvinistic in doctrine, although he was largely in the reform camp. He means not Calvinistic in doctrine, but renewed in practice. He was calling for a renewal or a revival of how pastors viewed their calling and their ministry. So I'll conclude this paper by setting forth eight exhortations taken largely from the Reformed pastor that I'm convinced Baxter would want to give to the contemporary church and to the pastors of today. First, focus on conversion. Baxter's emphasis in ministry was on conversion. Other Puritans wrote on conversion, but Baxter wrote more than any other and was apparently read more than any other writer on this topic. His call to the unconverted was the most popular book of its day in all of England. It sold 20,000 copies the first year. Now, that, that's significant even by today's publishing standards. He received letters virtually every week from people converted through reading the book. John Eliot, the great missionary to the Indians, translated Call to the Unconverted into Algonquin as soon as he had finished translating the Bible. Orm suggests that the overall effects of this book and the conversion of people have been, quote, possibly greater than have arisen from any other human performance. Its influence is beyond all calculation. Baxter understood the necessity of conversion. He said it is the very drift of the gospel, the main design of the whole word of God, to convert men from sin to God and to build them up once they are converted. Conversion is the most blessed work, and the day of conversion, the most blessed day that this world is acquainted with. He challenged ministers, therefore, to focus on conversion in their ministries. We must labor, he said, in a special manner for the conversion of the unconverted. The work of conversion is the first and great thing we must drive at, after this, we must labor with all our might. Alas, the misery of the unconverted is so great that it calleth loudest to us for compassion. He that seeth one man sick of a mortal disease and the other only pained with a toothache will be moved more to compassion for the former than the latter and will surely make more haste to help him though he were a stranger and the other a brother or a son. I confess I am frequently forced to neglect that which should tend to the further increase of knowledge in the godly because of the lamentable necessity of the unconverted. 
O oh, therefore, brethren, whomsoever you neglect, neglect not the most miserable. O oh, call after the impenitent and ply this great work of converting souls, whatever else you leave undone. A second principle, understand the true nature of conversion. Baxter taught that conversion was a process. People lie dead in sin and cannot respond until God moves them to do so through effectual grace. But this does not mean they are to sit idly by and wait for God to work. They should prepare themselves through seeking God and listening to His Word. Though Baxter avoided that saying such preparation makes God beholden to the individual, a position that is sometimes erroneously attributed to him. Some recent interpreters have characterized the Puritans as teaching that all must follow a set pattern of experiences to be converted, a, a set morphology of conversion. Baxter knew from Scripture and observation this was not the case and taught that God breaketh not all men's hearts alike. Breaking them, however, in the sense of causing inbred love of sin to shrivel up so that love for Christ and holiness can blossom is something God must do and does, one way or another, in every case of genuine new birth. Baxter anticipated, in a way, the current debate about lordship salvation. Faith entereth at the mind, he taught, but it hath not all its essential parts and is not the gospel faith indeed, Till it hath possessed the will. The heart of faith is wanting till faith has taken possession of the heart. Christ must be believed in with all a person's heart, soul, and strength. Baxter wrote, You must receive and close with Christ entirely in His whole office as He is to accomplish all these works or else you cannot be united to Him. He will not be divided. You shall not have Christ as justifier of you if you will not have him as guide and ruler and sanctifier of you. He will not be a partial savior. If you will not consent that he shall save you from your sins, he will not consent to save you from hell. Baxter would challenge the contemporary church to carefully examine her understanding of the nature of conversion. A third exhortation, guard your own heart. Baxter began his exhortation of the Reformed pastor with Paul's opening phrase in Acts 20:28, 20, Take heed to yourselves. He notes that before we can properly take heed to the flock, we must exercise personal oversight over ourselves. He says, Content not yourselves with being in a state of grace, but also be careful that your graces are kept in vigorous and lively exercise and that you preach to yourselves the sermons which you study before you preach them to others. He reflects on the importance of protecting our own walk with God. He says, when I let my heart grow cold, my preaching is cold. And when my heart is confused, my preaching is confused. And so I can oft observe also in the best of my hearers that when I have grown cold in preaching, they have grown cold too. And the next prayers which I have heard from them have been too much like my preaching. We are the nurses of Christ's little ones. If we forbear taking food ourselves, we shall famish them. Perhaps Baxter's greatest challenge to contemporary pastors in guarding their hearts would be in the area of pride. He asks, is not pride the sin of devils, the firstborn of hell? Is it to be tolerated in men who are so engaged against Satan and his kingdom as we are? The very design of the gospel is to abase us. Humility is not a mere ornament of a Christian, but an essential part of the new creature. It is a contradiction in terms to be a Christian and not be humble. Baxter would give his hearty agreement to James Denny's observation that no man can bear witness to himself and to Christ at the same time. No man can give at once the impression that he is clever and that Christ is mighty to save. A fourth admonition is preach the word. Baxter would want to subdivide that and give us two challenges here today. First, to preach with passion. 
In his poetical fragments, he gives his perspective on preaching. He writes, Still thinking I had little time to live, my fervent heart to win men's souls did strive. I preached as never sure to preach again, as a dying man to dying men. Baxter would challenge us to preach that way, as if we would never preach again as a dying man to dying men. He believed most preachers needed more passion in their preaching. Listen to these words. If we were hardly devoted to our work, it would be done more vigorously and more seriously than it is by the most of us. How few ministers do preach with all their might or speak about everlasting joys and everlasting torments in such a manner as may make men believe that they are in good earnest. Oh, sirs, how plainly, how closely, how earnestly should we deliver a message of such moment as ours when the everlasting life or everlasting death of our fellow man is involved in it? What? Speak coldly for God and for men's salvation? Can we believe that our people must be converted or condemned and yet speak in a drowsy tongue? In the name of God, brethren, Labor to awaken your own hearts before you go to the pulpit, that you may be fit to awaken the hearts of sinners. Oh, speak not one cold or careless word about so great a business as heaven or hell. Whatever you do, let the people see that you are in good earnest. Second exhortation Baxter would give to contemporary preachers is to preach with balance. Our culture disdains what it calls fire and brimstone preaching. Yet Baxter would emphasize fear must drive as well as love draw. A fifth exhortation is to minister to individuals. This was really the heart of his method in the Reformed pastor. Look at this quote of when he came to understand that he needed to do more than simply preach to his people. He said, I study to speak as plainly and movingly as I can. And I frequently meet with those that have been my hearers eight or ten years who know not whether Christ be God or man and wonder when I tell them the history of his birth and life and death as if they had never heard it before. I have found by experience that some ignorant persons who have been so long unprofitable hearers have got more knowledge and remorse of conscience in half an hour's close discourse than they did from ten years' public preaching. I know that preaching the gospel publicly is the most excellent means because we speak to so many at once. But it is usually far more effectual to preach it privately to a particular sinner as to himself. I conclude, therefore, that public preaching alone will not be sufficient. Long may you study and preach to little purpose if you neglect this duty of personal instruction. And Baxter did not neglect that duty. In a community of some 800 homes, he visited every single home in that parish at least once a year, making 15 to 16 visits each week. A sixth exhortation, pursue family reformation. You see the quote there. He believed that in order for religion to grow and prosper, it needed to be not only individual reformation, but family. A seventh exhortation is to keep your heart in heaven. Baxter believed in meditation and in meditating on heaven. He says the most covetous man will let go of silver if he might have gold instead of it. He says, if you would have light and heat, why are you not more in the sunshine? For want of this recourse to heaven, thy soul is as a lamp not lighted. Thy duty is a sacrifice without fire. Fetch one coal daily from this altar and see if thy offering will not burn. We often hear the expression today, well, he's too heavenly minded to be of any earthly good. Baxter would say, unless you are heavenly minded, you will probably not be of any earthly good. And then finally, maintain a balance of head and heart. We need not only head, but also heart, both doctrine and practice. Some in our day seem to make a keen mind antithetical to a warm heart. 
and a focus on theology antithetical to a commitment to practical ministry. As Carl F.H. Henry said in 1967, in these next years we must strive harder to become theologian evangelists rather than to remain content as just theologians or just evangelists. Henry's challenge mirrors James Denny's famous dictum, if evangelists were our theologians or theologians were our evangelists, we should at least be nearer the ideal church. Richard Baxter was such a man, and he challenges us to be one as well. We would all do well to heed the words of Spurgeon and go fetch Baxter. Well, we do have time for some questions, and uh, if uh, Dr. Bucher could repeat the question, uh, for the sake of the audio. Any questions? If we were to read one more of our Baxter, what um, to, uh, to quote John Wesley, read them all, they're all good. Uh, uh, I, I would say the Reformed pastor, but, but a very close second would be the Saints' Everlasting Rest. But uh, again, to quote J.I. Packer, if you're in pastoral ministry and you do not have a well-worn copy of the Reformed pastor on your shelf, you're nuts. So let it not be said that J.I. Packer said you were nuts. Have a well-worn copy of the Reformed pastor on your shelf. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, I, I think that we've got a whole another session on it. I tried to deal with that somewhat in my book. That that's a I'll try and give the Reader's Digest version, uh, realizing it's going to uh, not even begin to do justice to it. Uh, what I argue in in my doctoral work and eventually published in this book is that. I think Baxter's comments uh, were, or, or I think his presentation there was not as bad as what some critics say. I, I think a lot of the, the challenge here was simply in Baxter's use of terms. Without having gone through formal classical theological education, being very steeped in reading of the early fathers, he did not have that clear line of demarcation between justification and sanctification that we understand today. And so in a lot of his discussions, the two bleed together. And I'm, I'm not arguing that Baxter's position is not without criticism. But, but I'm not sure that Baxter's as guilty of what people charge against him in his views as what he is. So sort of like the old uh, uh, challenge in church history, was Nestorius a Nestorian. Well, what was Baxter really a Baxterian? I, I heard that maybe that, that some of uh, the challenges against his position uh, are overstated, but uh, others have critiqued my work and said that I have understated them. Thus, thus the world of theological discourse. Yes? I got some questions about it today that it's on that same line, but okay, that's the next one. Okay. But Mm -hmm. um, speaking of the mere fiction of amusement, would he not be more quoting when he says that? Is he not more taking a biblical standpoint? And because when I say that, right after that you mentioned the Presbyterian, would he still be correct if he stayed as a Presbyterian, denying the Westminster Confession? No, he. Uh, you know, and again, how to classify Baxter? He it's like trying to nail Jello to the wall. He actually argued for a modified episcopy. He, he, here was Baxter's sort of classic quote on that. He said, I'm not against bishops as long as they're godly. 
His concern was once you get an Episcopal system and the bishops are ungodly, you've got serious issues, and that, that's what he faced. So he, he, he's often classified as a Presbyterian and would be seen as that, but he, he personally was not opposed to the use of the prayer book. It was the conscription of it and, and the forcing of it on others that, that he had issues with. He actually he wrote his own liturgy, Reformed liturgy, uh, later on and tried uh, in, the, you know, in bringing people together. So we have evidence of exactly what he would have done. Yeah, I, I mean, using the terms today, I don't know that we would have used that term back then, but using that term today, I think that would be a, an accurate picture. Again, he, he wanted to strive for unity, you know, in, in essentials, unity, in non-essentials, freedom, and all things love. That, that phrase Baxter really brought <clears throat> to the English-speaking world. He, he really desired that, but again, his own... Uh, personality, if you will. But Baxter said, I, I have a problem. It is that I call a spade a spade. And, and that's what he did. He always spoke his mind, and that sometimes created more conflict, even as he was seeking to bring peace. Yes? Yes, yes, uh, absolutely, and he practiced that in his parish there at Kidderminster and instructed others to do that. Uh, he believed that was very important and wanted it under local control. That would have been the modified episcopy where there was still local parish control over discipline. Yes. Well, his uh, systematic theology that he wrote in Latin uh, hit the world with a resounding thud. Uh, it's, it's a terrible uh, work. Uh, you know, I, I think uh, James Stevens' observation of it is correct. He, he used the Latin tongue with reckless facility. So I, I do, th you know, it hurt him there. And again, he desired to be seen as a theologian among other theologians. That, why do you write a systematic theology in Latin? It's not for your lay people. But <clears throat> the, the book was, it, it simply landed with a thud. Well, thank you again. Okay, thank you.